Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Gebrian, and this video series is going to be about something called variable practice. So I think most of us know that in order to perform well, you have to do enough correct repetitions to make whatever it is you're working on reliable, right? You want that tricky shift to be super solid. You want your quality of sound or your pacing or whatever to be exactly how you want it and reliable so you can do it every single time. But is exact repetitions, is doing exact repetitions the best way to practice? That's the question we're gonna to try to answer today. The first thing to know is that there's inherent variability in the motor system. So we can't literally reproduce exactly the same movement twice. We just can't. That may be frustrating, but that's the way the motor system works. And there was actually a study that followed two elite discus throwers for a whole year. And the researcher in this study found that they never once replicated the same throw twice. And these are elite discus throwers, right? They're really, really good at what they do. They spent a lot of time figuring out the best, most efficient, most effective way to throw the discus, and yet they could never replicate exactly the same throw twice. So we have inherent variability. Can we use that to our advantage in the practice room? Whenever people discuss variable practice, the same study is often cited. It's a study from the 1970s that was done on kids throwing beanbags. You may be familiar with the study already, but if not, I'll describe it briefly. So basically in this study, kids had to learn to throw beanbags to a target and be as accurate as they could with hitting the target. So one group of the kids practiced throwing beanbags to a target that was three feet away, and the other group of kids practiced throwing beanbags to targets that were two feet away and four feet away, but never three feet away. Then all the kids were tested on throwing beanbags to a target that was three feet away. If you've never read this study before or heard about it, I think you would guess that the kids that practiced throwing to three feet would do the best in the test, right? They practiced exactly what they're gonna to have to do on the test. But actually, the kids that practiced throwing to two feet and four feet did better on the test, which is pretty surprising, right? So they think they got this result because when you practice in a more variable way, you develop a deeper, more flexible, more nuanced understanding of the skill that you can then generalize to other circumstances. Um, an interesting side note about this study that I didn't realize until I read it for the first time was the kids couldn't actually see where they were throwing. So they would just throw without being able to see and then they'd get feedback on how well they did. So that's kind of like crazy to me. Um, but so this result is cited very, very often as evidence that variable practice is better than um, what's often called constant practice, um, practice that's exactly the same. But a big issue in science is replication. So if somebody finds a really surprising result and then nobody can replicate that result in other research studies, it calls that first result into question. Maybe they just found it because it was a fluke, right? And because nobody can replicate it. So has the beanbag study been replicated? The short answer is yes, it has. I'll give you some examples of studies that replicated this, but they also had um, some interesting twists to them. So one of them was another beanbag study with kids, but in this particular study, they weren't throwing to different distances only. They were also throwing beanbags of different weights. So they had to throw different weight beanbags to different distances. And some of the kids, again, had constant weight, constant distance. Other kids, it was variable. And once again, in the final test, they found that the kids that had had variable weights and variable distances did better, were more accurate at throwing their beanbags. So replication with beanbags. There was another study that was done with elementary school kids and teenagers, this time looking at uh, tennis, being able to hit a tennis ball to a target. This one has a little bit of a complicated design. So let me explain exactly what the various groups had to do. In this study, there were four different groups and each one had a different task. So group A had to practice hitting the tennis ball towards target five here. So that's what group A did. They just had to hit target five. All right, group B had to practice hitting towards four different targets. So that's this one, two, three, four. So those were the four targets that group B had to do. Group C had to hit towards five different targets. So that's all five here. So we can put a C on all five different targets. And then group D, they didn't have to try to hit any target. They just had to get it over the net. Um, so we can say group D, if it's over the net, they are 
good. So that's what the four groups had to do. In the testing situation, everybody just had to hit target A. So all four groups, all they had to do was aim towards target A. This graph shows the results of their performance test after they had finished practicing. And you can see that for both the kids and the teenagers, the groups that practiced hitting to the five different targets are doing the best. That's not really surprising given what we've talked about so far. The really interesting thing to me in this result is if you look at the people that practiced hitting towards one target, and remember the people that practiced hitting towards one target were hitting towards the target they were tested on. So those people were no better than the people that practiced hitting towards no target. They just had to get it over the net. So if you look at those two data points, there's no advantage to practicing hitting towards just that one target, the same target they were tested on, over just trying to get it over the net. So that's super interesting. So these are just a few studies that have found that variable practice works better than constant practice. We don't have to go into more because I think you get the point. Um, and like I said, the rationale is that when you do variable practice, you develop a deeper, more flexible version of the skill that's more durable over time and also translates to other situations well, which is exactly what we want as performers, right? We don't want to give a cookie cutter performance of a piece of music. That would be really boring. We want the flexibility to do what we want on stage. Um, the other thing that's important to remember that I talk about a bit in my video about random practice, I'll link to in the comments below, is that our sense of how well we're doing is usually based on how well we're doing in practice, but the actual test of how much have we learned, how much have we gotten better, is in a performance situation. So you can't really know how well you're doing until you test it later after you're done practicing. Um, and variable practice it may look like the people are not doing as well when they're practicing, but once they are actually tested, people that practice under variable conditions do better. Unfortunately, I have some bad news next. There have been failures to replicate this. So that means studies that found that variable practice was not better. So a study from 2018 that tried to replicate the beanbag study, the famous one from the 1970s, this time with adults, they weren't able to replicate it. Um, so the variable group had a very, very small advantage, almost non-existent advantage over the constant group, but that advantage disappeared two weeks later. The two groups were the same. So that's not good. We don't want our practicing to evaporate like in two weeks, right? Another study that was done on basketball shooting, so free throw shooting, found that um, in a testing situation, the group that did variable practice did better on the first free throw they tried to make in a test situation, but the other free throws after that, so numbers two, three, four, five, however many they did, it was exactly the same performance between the two groups. So in this graph, SP stands for specific practice. So that's the group that practice their free throws from the same distance away every time. The SP plus VR, that is, um, they had variable practice. So they did their free throw shooting from, from different distances. And what you want to look at is where it says retention first trial and then retention blocks. And you can see that in the retention first trial, the variable practice group is doing way, way better than the group that practiced their free throws from the same spot every time. But after that very first shot, then they're exactly the same again. This is interesting though, as musicians, right? Because we often only get one shot. We don't get more than one shot. Um, so for musicians, this still, I think, shows that variable practice is better because we, we only get a first try, right? Um, but why is there this failure to replicate? And is there a way to know in your own practicing if variable practice or constant practice would be better? So that's what we're going to look at in part two.